after loving recent cruises on 600 and 700 passenger ships like Ocean Insignia, Azamara Quest, Seaborn Encore, I wanted to see if going even smaller was even better. So I booked myself on an 11 night Windstar Star Pride Lands of the Midnight Suns. Now this ship only holds 312 passengers and they claim to be the market leading small ship line. They have these yacht style engine driven ships that I went on, but they also have sailing vessels as well. Now, when I boarded and for the first few days, I could see that small had many upsides, but that will change as you will see. I loved the boarding in Edinburgh. It was such a breeze and so fast to check in because there were so few passengers. After boarding, I headed to my cabin. I booked a star balcony suite and was delighted by the cabin size and the two sink bathroom for such a small ship. The first small ship issue though reared its head as the so-called balcony was tiny. It wasn't a balcony at all. And this was the first of the trade-offs, the compromises coming to roost. I was paying for a balcony, but as you can see, not getting one. Next, anyway, I checked the daily program in the cabin and was encouraged though to see that there were a choice of six dining options on the ship. I decided to head to the veranda, which is the buffet restaurant, which was open for breakfast and of course I could see for lunch. The staff when I was there told me that each day lunch was gonna be themed around a different cuisine, a different country. And if the buffet didn't appeal to me, there was also a small menu both at lunch and at breakfast where I could order something else. Now I actually, ordered pancakes on a couple of the mornings off the menu, but actually never got round to ordering a hamburger off the lunch menu because the buffet was pretty good. I liked, by the way, that it also had an outside area, but other than one day on my cruise, it was a bit too chilly, unfortunately, to sit out there. Now, some people chose to go to the Star Grill for their lunch, an informal dining venue out on deck, which was also open for lunch every day. I discovered during the cruise, by the way, they occasionally also had themed lunches there, like a Scottish salmon one when we were in the Orkney Islands. Dinner, of course, is a key focus on any cruise, and I could see from the daily program there were three options available. Let me tell you how I got on. And for a was the main dining room. This was open seated dining, though I discovered that evening another hint of a potential issue because I asked to have a table by myself. And the maitre d' said he could do it for today, the first day, but he couldn't guarantee it because if the ship was full, that would not always be possible. Now I noticed there seemed to be fewer tables for two, there were more bigger tables for four or more, and sharing was actively encouraged when passengers arrived for dinner. Now, many of course love the idea of sharing, to be fair. Now, in the end, because the ship wasn't full, I was able to get a table by myself on the nights. I went by basically going at 7 p.m. when they opened. But this was another issue with small may mean that that's a challenge. There were two included speciality restaurants. First, there was Candles. Veranda was turned into this steak and seafood restaurant and did require booking. They guaranteed I could go once Though again, because the ship wasn't full, I actually went twice because the food there was really great. There was also Caudro 44, a Spanish restaurant with even better food in my opinion. Again, because the ship wasn't full, I was able to go twice. The downside though on the small ship was there was no casual dining option for me in the evening. Now I don't always want a big and a served meal every night. So I had to use room service, which I did twice actually. This had a rather small menu, although I could, as I discovered, have ordered from the actual Amphora menu every evening. There was another compromise being on such a small ship that struck me from the first night, which was that the menus had relatively tighter options, even versus those larger small ships, 600 to 700 passenger ships I was mentioning that had been on recently, like Oceania, Azamara, and Seaborn. But to compensate for this, what they did is they made a lot of their partnership with the James Beard Foundation. Now this awards chefs what seems to be kind of like the Oscars of cooking. Neither the lead dishes on the menus each day were recipes from a James Beard Foundation winning chef, or as in the case of Caldro 44, a partnership with Anthony Sasso that was linked to them, and the Star Grill that I mentioned earlier was another partnered with a guy called Stephen Rashlin. They also pushed the point about quality. They did this through a couple of cooking demonstrations by the executive chef. He spoke about making everything from scratch on board and he spoke a lot about the quality of the ingredients versus larger ships that he'd been on before. So across the cruise, 
while I felt there was a compromise on the breadth of the menus, especially versus the larger small ship lines like Oceania, I did find the food was great, to be honest, with probably just enough options. So a bit of a trade-off, but not terrible in the end. Now, I probably run a bit ahead of myself because before dinner that I mentioned earlier, I actually did two other things that I want to talk about. First, I attended the excursions talk, and again, some compromises, good and bad. At the excursions talk, I realized being a smaller ship seemed there was a more limited choice than I was used to on other cruises. And what I noticed, and this is important for something I will talk about later, almost all were active, e-bikes, RIB boat tours, hikes, walking tours, and they were costly compared to bigger ships. The one upside that I later discovered, which is a plus, is they were all in really small groups. Even when we got to Bergen, for example, I went on the Mount Ulriken cable car excursion. And although 38 people had booked on it and could all fit in one bus, they actually took us in two different buses in two smaller groups. So that is a real big positive trade-off. After the excursion talk, I did take time to explore the ship. And this is what compromises and upsides that I found. First of all, I really liked the size. It was really easy to get around. Through the trip, I loved that everything was literally kind of seconds or at most a few minutes away. Though, to be honest, there weren't that many places to go to. There was, for example, the Compass Rose Lounge where we had the welcome party later that evening. And during the cruise, it's where all the evening activities took place, trivia, live music, and the parties. There was the lounge, which I checked in, which is where they held that excursion talk I mentioned. And then across the cruise, they also held in here the port talks, the enrichment talks, the captain's welcome and farewell parties, and the crew talent show. For me though, the best lounge by far was the Yacht Club, which was overlooking the bow. They had hot drinks and snacks from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. served in there. Uh, I also, by the way, liked the size of the fitness and the spa, which I found coped really well with the numbers on the ship. It was a really good size for the amount of people on the ship. The shop was fine. It sold the usual stuff, watches, jewelry, clothes. Though disappointingly, it had limited Windstar merchandise for my liking. You know, being a smaller ship, I guess they had much less stuff. Outside, by the way, it was also spacious for the numbers, though the pool deck only had a kind of a plunge pool and one hot tub. It's not one that you could sit around and lay about on. On the bow on deck five was another hot tub that was really great space for scenic cruising days or as I did watching the tugboats when we set sail from Edinburgh. There was also lots of deck space to hang out in warm weather but in our case on the fjords cruise to basically stand out there and watch the amazing scenery. There's lots of space to do that. Now by the way if you want to know more about the ship specifically the Starpride ship I do have a full video tour of that. But let me talk about probably the biggest challenge and the issue that hit me on that first night and played out throughout the cruise. At the welcomable party in Compass Rose, I clicked. There was no entertainment team, just a lone cruise director along with a four-piece band and a music duo. In the evening, there were no shows, just live music like, unfortunately for me, the inevitable ABBA evening not something I enjoy. One evening the crew did a line dancing set for example and the only full show was a crew talent show. There was also by the way no casino. As I found quickly the daily program was pretty light. On port days there may be one daily trivia, lots of unhosted chess, bridge, mahjong, a cornhole game, maybe a film in the viewing room and then shopping and spa events and in the evening live music. On the sea days not much more was added with a cooking demonstration or some sort of food related activity like one day we had an on deck barbecue, one evening we had a galley market in Amphora where the galley was turned into a grand kind of buffet which was quite fun. On sea days there were though port talks, there we had a guest speaker Dr. Jean Kenyon, she spoke about whales, arctic animals, animal sounds, how undiscovered the ocean was. The captain did a talk about stretching the ship, so pretty light stuff going on. What I learned going on a, such a small ship is it's much more about socializing. Now I'm not a drinker. I don't particularly like sitting listening to live music very much. So the evenings for me I found much more challenging and particularly as a solo traveler I realized that you needed to be really outgoing to integrate because there weren't many diversions and you had to really make the effort to meet and sort of get involved with people. Now something that did not bother me but did some by the way 
being on such a small ship is because we were sailing like to the fjords, to Iceland, the seas were pretty choppy and there was quite a lot of movement. Now smaller ships of course have much more movement and some surprisingly did struggle with it much more than I think they probably expected and I don't think they were as prepared as they should be. So that is another watch out. The compromises and things I were missing did start to make me wonder if this was all just a bit too small for me. So I wanted to see what others were thinking and why there were clearly so many repeat Windstar travelers on board. So over the rest of the cruise, I started to speak to lots of people and I sat and kind of earwigged and listened in to what people were saying, which is something I found lots of good information about. I discovered four things through that that seemed to be pretty consistent amongst people who were really enjoying themselves on a ship this small. Now, first of all, the itinerary and the ports were their main passion and the lack of facilities and activities that I was missing really wasn't important to them. The small ship for them unlocked something way more important. So most guests seemed very well traveled and they wanted to see importantly new and out of the way places, not just the well known. And so in fact, the small size was really fundamental because it enabled just that. So for example, I've been to the fjords you know, multiple times on bigger ships, but going on this smaller ship took me to places that I had never been to before on those bigger ships. You know, we went to the Orkney Islands on the way there, we went to Molde, we went to Hellesand, and we just saw places that I hadn't seen before. And so I looked a little bit more. I looked, for example, at the Caribbean, a place I love going, and I saw that instead of sailing out of Florida, they mostly go from, say, St. Martin or, or Ranyastat, and they stop at way lesser visited islands than other cruisers go to, like St. Bart's, Guadalupe, Virgin Gorda, Marea, which I'd never even heard of, and Bonaire. On the cruise, by the way, they also ran a Middle Eastern Bazaar, which is a future cruise sales event. And they were talking about how they'd, they're creating sailings in parts of the world to open new regions to see. And they talk about how their small ships include stops that bigger ships couldn't even in these new regions. So that was kind of really interesting. I also realized that while the trivia, the live music and so on were actually not that well attended, but when they brought on board local entertainers, they ran ports, local enrichment talks, those events were packed, unlike the kind of activities. The ship, whenever we were in port, was empty. From the minute we arrived, pretty much until the minute we left, the ship was empty because those people, those travelers were out spending as much time exploring as they could. In fact, it was so empty that uh, various people seeing the photos and videos I was posting during the cruise when, when I was in port kept saying, where is everybody? It's because everybody was out all the time. The second key thing I clicked was really important and this was the informality and pretty much the lack of dress code. There was theoretically a dress code which basically said no shorts, trainers and kind of distressed jeans in the evening in the restaurant but dress code was very relaxed. This was not a flashy designer label get dressed for dinner experience. It was more like to be honest when I've been on an expedition cruise where what you bring what you wear was really low down on the list for the evenings. Now the third thing was with a maximum of 312 guests and 200 crew. Passengers were saying that they really liked that they got to know the crew and vice versa. It was very chatty, it was jokey and they liked always being called by your name and also the same crew would man lunch, dinner and the bars. Wherever I went around the ship they would always pop up, they'd know my favorite drink or quirk and that seemed really really important. Also passengers clearly loved access to senior crew. Windstar have an open bridge, I could pop in whenever I wanted to chat to the crew there except when we were coming in and out of port. Senior crew were always around the ship including the captain, he would eat in the buffet, he got to know my name, he got to know many people's names, he would stop and chat, he remembered what he, you, you know, he'd spoken to you about the last time. They also hosted uh, you know, meetups in the op club with the senior crew so that access and visibility of senior crew was really important to people. However, it became clear talking to others that although they were well traveled and independent, they of course wanted to do it with some luxury. They wanted good food, they wanted comfy plush cabins, which had upmarket lock stand toiletries, high quality bedding, but they didn't necessarily want to push it the next price level to a seaborne or a regent or a sil silver sea, you know, because that is much more focused on giving more choice, more options. The ship is even more fundamental to the overall experience. That was much less important. By the way, one thing that struck me was also that it was very American focused in food, in style and service. In fact, one of the slides in the future sales presentation had the line, 
the only US focused small ship line. And I would say easily, I would guess, I don't know, nine out of 10 of the passengers on my sailing anyway, were American. So based on all of this, would I rush back to such a small ship and Windstock Cruises? Now, while I'm thinking it probably was too small for me because I missed some of the buzz and the excitement in the evenings, you know, shows, casino, other activities. And I found the sea days, to be honest, not busy enough. I did and I do still find their approach to destinations, itineraries, visiting less well-visited ports appealing, especially in the more exotic parts of the world they go to, like French Polynesia, the Middle East, Asia, Australia. So I would, for a specific itinerary like that Middle East itinerary, which really appealed to me because it'd take me through the Suez Canal and so on. However, I would only return if it was a port intensive itinerary because having many sea days, being on a small ship with not many activities didn't really appeal. Now, if Windstar does appeal from what you've heard and you want to know more about, say, the Star Pride ship, take a look at this video because I talk about how the ship was actually stretched and new facilities were added. See you over there.